when I was a kid in times of, I guess, like extreme emotion, you know, sadness, I think in particular, I felt like I would just hear music in my head. I wasn't thinking that was like different or <laughs> weird or anything, but I just always kind of had tones and melodies happening um, based on my emotions. So it just kind of felt natural to start trying to put those out. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Why Music Matters podcast. I'm your host, music journalist and musician Jeff Myers. Throughout my life in and around music, I've often asked myself the question, why does music matter? This podcast will attempt to answer that question with the help of musicians, members of the music industry, and music lovers like you. Today on Why Music Matters, my guest is musician and DJ Chelsea O'Donnell. Chelsea began her career in radio as host of the local show on 1077 FM Alternative Buffalo, where she helped that station celebrate the rich variety of local and regional indie rock from Western New York. These days, you can hear Chelsea on WBFO The Brit, where she hosts The Scene, a show focusing on original independent music from Western New York and Southern Ontario every Sunday. Concurrent with all this, Chelsea writes, records, performs, and tours with her indie rock band Stress Dolls. This immersion in independent music has granted Chelsea a unique perspective on why music matters to cities, to scenes, and to each of us individually. Join us. Hey, everybody, welcome to Why Music Matters. I'm your host, Jeff Myers. Got my friend Ch Chelsea O'Donnell here today. Welcome, Chelsea. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. How are you doing? Good. Um, Chelsea is a very cool and interesting person with a, a kind of broad perspective on why music matters. Right? <laughs> um, she's a musician, uh, leader of the band Stress Dolls. Um, she also oversees uh, The Scene, which is WBFO, The Bridge's local show, Sundays at 10. Yes, you're yes. right. <laughs> you got it. I got it right. Um, and before that, people in Buffalo will probably remember her from uh, 1077 Alternative Buffalo, um, the, the dearly departed and missed <laughs> uh, station, which you also did the local show mm -hmm. on that station as well. Anyway, welcome. Thank you. Um, it, um, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I think you have a unique perspective on why music matters, and I'd like to start by talking about why music has mattered to you uh, personally mm -hmm. before we get into what you're doing with the local show. Okay. It's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question, and I can, I can narrow it down a little bit. I guess I'd like to start by asking, when did music start to matter to you and how did that come about sure um at a very young age yeah. um so my dad has always been really involved with music he's a musician himself um not full-time but he's always been in bands and he writes his own music too plays guitar uh so when i was really young we'd be going to his shows and um he really encouraged that pursuit yeah. Um, so when I was five, I think I started taking piano lessons uh, with Ann Philippone, actually, yeah. who many. So this was in Buffalo. Yes, mm -hmm. maybe familiar with Ann plays at yes. Nietzsche still every Sunday. She's great. She's, She's a good friend. Awesome. Yeah, and so um, that was sort of like my way in. My first favorite song was actually Linus and Lucy by <laughs> um, Vince Guaraldi. So That's I had pick. that. Yeah, on cassette tape. I remember getting that for my birthday around the same time. Uh, and I took piano for about 10 years, but it was probably when I was around 13 or 14 that I started getting really interested in rock music. And and my dad like was always listening to Tom Petty, Neil Young, The Beatles, The Rolling Stones. Great songwriters. Eh? Yeah. So growing up, that was the music that my brother and I were kind of surrounded by. Um, and we liked the oldies. And then, of course, when I became, you know, a preteen teenager, you kind of get more into the pop music that's yeah. on the radio. Um but I think, like I said, I got more into rock, like Green Day. Yeah. I loved Fall Out Boy. <laughs> a lot of the mainstream rock that you, you know, heard at the time. Um, so my dad saw that and uh, saw that I was kind of interested in the guitar, and he got me a guitar for my 14th birthday. And um, after that, it was just sort of, you know, 
an obsession. Shout out to the musician dads. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. So that was kind of my like pathway into it. Uh, but even when I was, before I was playing the guitar and writing songs on guitar, um, the first song I ever actually like wrote officially was on piano and it was a totally instrumental piece. And when I was a kid in times of, I guess like extreme emotion, you know, sadness, I yeah. think in particular, I felt like I would just hear music in my head. I wasn't thinking that was like different or <laughs> weird or anything, but I just always kind of had tones and melodies happening um, based on my emotions. So it just kind of felt natural to start trying to put those out. That's amazing. So when did it become for you more than like oh this is something cool that i you know that i'm into to oh this is like a major part of who i am um i'd say probably around that same like 14 yeah yeah just the alienation because, years yeah exactly like when you're trying to find who you are and yeah. i'm not sure I don't know if any of us ever truly know like who exactly we are, you know what I mean? Like I think your base is always kind of the same, yeah. but you grow, you change. Um but yeah, I'd say it was probably around that time that it felt very serious and like something I truly wanted to do. However, uh I think it was hard maybe even to myself to admit that because I was a really shy mm -hmm. kid and I had a hard time with insecurities as basically all of us do, but I just didn't feel confident in my voice in particular. Um, even though I was writing songs and singing them to myself, yeah. I was terrified of the thought of performing them in front of people. Like I wanted to so badly, but I just felt like it was out of reach because yeah. I was so scared. Um, that vulnerability felt uh, too close too raw, or too, comfort. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Too raw. Um, but I, I just knew I wanted it. So I, I kept pushing towards that. Like I kept writing, um, like I said, I wouldn't even sing in front of my parents. But finally, when I was probably like 17, I want to say 18, uh, in high school, there was an open mic night and I just decided like, you know what, I got to rip off this Band-Aid. I'm going to perform an original song. And I did it and it was well received. I mean, who knows how the performance yeah. <laughs> actually went. Um, I'm sure it wasn't. There's gotta be video. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sure there is somewhere. I don't know if I'll ever uh, end up showing it to anybody, but um, my friends were just so supportive and my parents were really supportive. And that kind of gave me the motivation I needed in order to feel like, okay, maybe this is something that I could do, not necessarily um, professionally, yeah. but just something that could be a, a large portion of my life moving forward. I think it's interesting that conventional wisdom is that, you know, people, especially songwriters who also sing or are like the front person in, in an ensemble or whatever, I think the assumption is often that they're extroverted, that they're, you know, they, they crave the spotlight. But it's interesting, I think a lot of people who form this deep bond with music and make it a primary mode of their expression aren't like that, are kind of introverted. Mm -hmm. um, so it it sounds like, you know, your love of music actually helped you not just overcome your fears as a performer, but maybe gave you confidence just in the rest of life. Is that true? I think so. Yeah. I think like we were saying before, especially when you're young and you're trying to find yeah. sort of an identity. Um, yeah. Like for me last year. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's, I mean, it's, it is, it can be unmooring to feel as though you don't know exactly what you're connected with. Right. So once yeah. I had guitar, especially, and I was kind of like in high school, I became sort of known as like, oh, she's the one who is good at guitar. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, that was my dream already. <laughs> I mean, like anybody was saying that I had a, a skill at guitar was such a um, moment for me. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It just felt like a way to, I don't know what the word is I'm searching for, because like on one hand, I feel like when, you don't want to identify yourself with any one thing, but it yeah. does help to give you a sense of who you are. Yeah, and yeah. stability, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, I know you, you left town for a while um it kind of was concurrent with a lot of crazy stuff going on in the <laughs> world i guess but um i know vaguely just from speaking to you that you know there have been some struggle 
around that. And I'm wondering if you mind talking about a little bit and maybe talk about how music, well, I think it kind of led you away, right? But maybe brought you back and helped you through it yeah, as well. Definitely. Um, so I moved to Nashville. Um, this was in the fall of 2017. Uh, so what kind of made that whole thing happen was that, um, first of all, I'd always kind of wanted to live away from Buffalo yeah. just because. To try it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To try it. I've been here my whole life and I love Buffalo, but it would just felt like maybe a change would be good. Um, but earlier on in that year, I had had a lineup for Stress Styles and it had kind of fallen apart. And so it just sort of felt like maybe the right time to make that sort of a move, see if I can meet musicians who would be open to, if I couldn't find like a group of people that wanted to do it consistently, I knew that Nashville was a place that you could find like so many great musicians all in one city. city. Exactly. That would maybe be willing to just join you even for a show or two or Mm -hmm. would get the material quickly. You know what I mean? Like they'd be fast learners. So, um, and there's the whole songwriting aspect and the music industry in general. So I've kind of figured that if I went there, even if I couldn't make it, quote unquote, as an artist, um, there were other opportunities within music that I could explore. Uh, So I went and it was a great experience. However, concurrent with that, I was dealing and still am to this day and had been for a few years prior um, with health issues, primarily GI related. Um, I have Crohn's, colitis. I also have something called gastroparesis. Uh, So upon moving, I wasn't exactly in a great place with my health, but I was also sort of so hellbent on getting there and figured that since these issues are chronic, I was going to be dealing with them for the rest of my life anyway. So I just kind of wanted to do it um, against probably the better judgment. And, you know, people who loved me were sort of like, maybe you should wait. And I was like, "Mm, I don't want to. (laughs) Did you know people there when you got there? Um, Not really. I had like a few sort of acquaintance connections. Um, Through radio? No, actually... um, kind of through college mm. more so. I had some people who I had known from working at Fredonia Radio yeah. who had ended up moving to Nashville. Um, shout out to Fredonia. Yeah, shout out to Fredonia. Love Fredonia. And then actually um, Phil Dillon, who yeah. is now back in Buffalo, um, I kind of got connected in with him through John Brady and Ann Philippone. And, uh, so, but other than that, I ended up just meeting people there from going to open mic nights and exploring uh, the community, and I'm still in touch with a few of them to this day. So um, it was a really neat experience. But uh, anyway, it the whole point of the health stuff is that it caught up with me. <laughs> and so I was there for about six months, which really isn't you know a super long time. And then I uh, I came home to see one of my specialists because things were going in such a poor direction, and they were like, "Yeah, we think you need a feeding tube, and you should be hospitalized." <laughs> So obviously that was a big wah, wah, like yeah. <laughs> cut off to Nashville. And so I I did go to the hospital. I was supposed to be there for a week. I ended up being there for like three weeks because um, things went wrong. There was a lot of, I guess, drama that <laughs> was yeah. not anticipated. And uh, I moved back home afterwards. And I was really feeling as though I, I wanted so badly to get back to Nashville and I was planning on it. I had actually started working as a freelance journalist for WSM AM radio, which is the home of the Grand Old Opry. Yeah. Uh, I was working part-time at the Nashville Children's Theater. So I was like still keeping in touch with these jobs and they were willing to keep me on. But after a couple months, it was clear that I was like, I can't It was too much. go back. It's too much. Yeah, it was too much. Um, so, but music was kind of you know, it helped me to get out of that dark (laughs) mental place because it's like, you know, uh, I got back home and I was just kind of feeling like, wow, I'm what I was at the time, 27. And it's like, I just feel like this might be all I am now. Like I'm a sick person, Um, which was challenging to (laughs) accept. And I also didn't want to feel that way, but it just looked pretty bleak, to be honest, Um, just because there were so many things unanswered. Uh, There had been so many things I had tried already that did not seem to be making the situation any better. Uh, But I still have a very clear recollection of being on the sofa. And I still had at that point, you know, I do not have the feeding tube any longer. The feeding tube only lasted a matter of months before it, uh, malfunctioned and then they actually ended up taking it out and it was 
this whole other story. <laughs> but I still remember being on the sofa. I had the feeding tube in, you know, I'm laying there. And then suddenly I just felt inspired to write down some words. Um, and I, you know, like wrote in my journal, got out my guitar. And within like 15 minutes, I had a song called Dream, which I actually ended up recording with my friend um, Charles Dussel from a band called Lone Star Sailing from Buffalo. And uh, that song will always mean a lot to me. But anyway, that was the first song that I wrote coming out of the experience and kind of like reminded me that, okay, um, this is still something I feel compelled and meant to do no matter what happens with it. You know what I mean? Like no matter if it becomes something that's like the biggest part of my life or if it's just me now at home Mm -hmm. writing songs or like in whatever capacity this can still be part of my world, I want it there. And it feels like something that is in me and it can never stop. And in a way, it kind of helped you transcend that idea of your illness defining you. Right? Yeah, definitely. You know, you're kind of reclaiming <laughs> your passion. Amazing. And and since then, I mean, the writing kept coming, right? Yeah, <laughs> it did. It didn't stop. Um, and I was actually really fortunate because, well, it was <laughs> so goofy. Um, so I still... I started playing out again. Yeah. Um, what was really great is people were so understanding. You know, I would, I started playing solo because I really felt like I couldn't, I wasn't comfortable being in a band at that point in time. I couldn't be relied on for practices. I, I didn't want anyone else depending on the project, frankly, um, just because of the unpredictability of the symptoms. And I didn't feel like explaining it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, yeah, I made stress styles a solo thing. Um, and then also, let's be real, like, Sometimes being a solo act makes things a lot easier <laughs> as far as booking. You're yeah, the only person you right. need to. It's easier to delegate responsibility because exactly. it's all you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, slowly throughout 2018, 2019, started playing out again, um, kind of established it as a solo thing and, uh, you know, met more people in the scene. It's like prior to leaving Buffalo, um, you know, like I said, I wasn't gone very long, but it's funny. You come back and there's already like new people things change doing quickly it. Here. Yeah. yeah, things do change quickly. Although, you know, they also kind of change slowly too, but in a microcosmic way, they change quickly. Right. Like as far as just new artists coming on yeah. and there were already like new songwriters I hadn't really been familiar with or met before. And even people maybe from before who like were around, but I just hadn't had the opportunity to really interact with them. So it was nice. It was kind of a refreshing return to this scene that I knew I loved already. Now it was like, wow, I I love it even more. Um, And then I finally, around 2020, figured out a medication that worked for me. Things started to feel a lot better physically. And then the pandemic. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it was like, oh, okay, well, now I'm still, you know, it's funny because I've talked to other people about this. And I think the pandemic for me was perhaps a little less of a shock just because already for those past two years, I had to be careful, right? Right. Everything I'd had to be careful. And I was primarily at home because a lot of the times, like the symptoms of Crohn's colitis are, like I said earlier, they're unpredictable. Um, It can be hard to leave your house because not to be TMI, but like a lot to do with bathroom stuff, a lot to do with like, Hey, I'm not comfortable just like being out and about when it could hit me out of nowhere. And if there's no bathroom nearby, or you're at Nietzsche's. (laughs) Oh my! God. <laughs> yeah, or maybe, <laughs> maybe a place where like you don't want to have to run, you know? Ex- yeah. Yes. Exactly. So, um, in any event, so I guess I was a little bit used to it going into that whole time. Uh, doesn't mean that it was always easy or like no. you know. I think for all of us, it was traumatic and it was hard to be without socialization. Um, but I don't know. I guess maybe that kind of mentally prepared me for the pandemic. So I, then I did have a. A chance at remission, I guess. And really for like until just recently, I was in a pretty remissive state with my health, which has been such a um, a blessing, I suppose, in terms of, you know, getting the band together yeah. and recording and all these opportunities that have been able to come my way. So I'm hopeful for the future. You know, at the moment, I'm kind of up and down right now with what's happening with all of this. Yeah. But um, I at least feel like uh I've been given so many amazing opportunities and I can only hope that going into whatever is to come next, those will aid it. Absolutely. Um, Concurrent with all this, let's talk about um, your work in radio, which has been, you know, a semi-constant throughout this period too. Definitely. Um, So you've talked a bit about, you know, why music matters to you and how it's helped you and, and guided you and kind of been there for you when you needed it. What about why music matters to a community? Sure. Um, 
And why corporate radio doesn't matter. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I think... That's a joke. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Um, well, why music matters to a community. I think it, music is community. Yeah. Like, it brings people together. Um, and I think that what's cool about this music community yeah. is that I feel like we have, like, I don't know, a lot of respect for each other at least when I'm interacting with people I do feel like there's always a level of respect there I feel like people don't feel confined to their genre quote unquote mm -hmm. like I see bills that are all different genres on one bill which I think is super cool it's very encouraging yeah definitely and um, I think too it's just nice to showcase like just like local businesses, the local talent, I mean, it matters. And every artist that you hear now on mainstream radio was once a local artist, most of the time. I mean, unless they're totally manufactured. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, uh, you know, most of the time they were um, a local artist. So it's important to support the local arts. It's, support, it's important to support the local music community. Um, get out there, see some shows. Yeah. Find somebody you like. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's something out Talk there for you. Yeah. yeah, like especially in Buffalo. I mean, I, I don't know. I always kind of I feel like too the local music moniker sometimes is it almost Majority. sounds like a yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's so not true. No. <laughs> At all, especially it's Definitely not true in Buffalo. No. No. The, the level of musicianship is high. Definitely. Especially for the size of the population. Mhm. Mm Would you I know you, well, I don't want to say only, but you were in Nashville for a relatively short time. Mm -hmm. But would you feel comfortable comparing, contrasting? I mean, from like my limited, I guess, experience, yeah. um, I think I would say that the circles I was hanging out with in that city, like I felt I was feeling that same sense of warmth yeah. and community um, because I was going to kind of a lot of sort of the punk shows and the rock shows. Um, and it didn't feel necessarily competitive or uh, cutthroat um, from talking to other people who were in the community and were perhaps maybe more, um, you know, Broadway is a very big thing there, yeah. that, that strip where there's literally music 24-7 and uh, people get into that grind and it's competitive, It's competitive, right? And you're playing covers like mm -hmm. all the time. <laughs> um, and I think that on that level and then just out and around town. I mean, because people move there to make it, which there's nothing wrong with. Yeah. Um, I think though some people move there, it's not even just to like make it in music. It's like, I want to be famous, which yeah. once again, like if that's your thing, cool. But like, it, it's I think- It's different than wanting to be a musician. It is, <laughs> right. And I think it also comes with a different mindset sure. of how you're going to approach yeah. people and how you view others in your vicinity as being competition instead yeah. of being like, in my brain, um, I think at the end of the day, in order for anybody to be truly successful, like no one person gets success on their own. I mean, it takes what they say, like it takes a village, but it's true. I mean, like you have so many others who help you along the way. And if you're kind of this like singular minded person, like, oh, it's just me. And like, yeah. I'm going to, I mean, I don't see how that is going to help you in the long run. I think you have to acknowledge that um, there are others who are, you know, on the same path as you and that's okay. And like their success does not determine your success and vice versa. And I truly believe in artists supporting each other and lifting each other up. And I think that's something Buffalo does really well, at least yeah. in my experience, that's what I've seen. Yeah. And I, you know, I've been here a long time and through a couple <laughs> generations of this music scene now. And largely I would agree with you. Um, you know, the scene kind of ex is expanding outward and being more inclusive all the time. Mm -hmm. You could argue that it's moving too slow, but it's moving mm -hmm. and, and that's encouraging. Um, so music and community, if we could kind of pivot to radio a little bit, um, what role can radio play in encouraging community and expanding the idea of localness? Um, and, you know, when have you seen that work and, you know, when have you seen it not work? 
Okay. So actually, speaking of Nashville, (laughs) there's a station in Nashville called Lightning 100 that I absolutely adored when I was there. And I desperately tried to get a job there (laughs) um, because I saw exactly what I always envisioned for radio, which is that they do play national artists, but a lot of their programming are the artists who are actually in Nashville, which is so cool because you're turning on the radio and like you're hearing the people that are playing around town and their home base is that city. It's amazing. And then they're treated the same way that a national or international artist is treated. Exactly. Why? Because they're as good, right? Yes. <laughs> and it was cool too because like they actually Lightning had their own open mic night. I did attend it a few times, but they would choose people from the open mic night and invite them on air to perform live. They would do a little interview segment with them. I just thought it was so neat that they were actually incorporating the community into this very popular station that so many people were listening to in the city. Um And like we were saying, I mean, they still had the national acts. They still had the really big shows. I think I remember them hosting a show with like Jimmy World and whatever. So it's not like they were just catering towards only the local. No, it's not parochial, right? It's just inclusive. (laughs) Exactly. Right. And I know that, of course, some people might hear that and think, well, yeah, of course, it's Nashville. You know what I mean? It's like, well, the talent's off the charts, whatever. But frankly, like. There's like we keep saying, there's a lot of talent in a city like Buffalo too, and it's not even just. I mean, musicianship, yes, and I want to include a musicianship, the songwriting. Yes. Like there is some. That's that is music. Right. Like there's some really great songwriting that is happening in this city. Um, frankly, stuff that I think you could hear like on mainstream radio, and you would not bat an eyelash if it were next to some of the other alternative bands that you're hearing now. Absolutely. Um. So bringing it back, uh, the, that is why WBFO The Bridge yeah. <laughs> really appealed to me when I first heard that they were coming and what they were doing, because really, to me, it sounds a lot like what Lightning 100. Yeah. Or you know. I don't know if we talked about this before, but a station I listen to a lot is KEXP out of Seattle. Yes. Yeah. I'm uh, familiar with them. Mm-hmm. Amazing. I mean, we stream it at home all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's very much how you describe Lightning um, Seattle, but they you know, right alongside Pearl Jam or whatever, they're Mm -hmm. playing, you know, a band that you could see down the street in Seattle, you know, and and really encouraging this sort of the Seattle community while also I'm not living in Seattle, but I listen to it here and I'm learning all the time Yeah, about new bands, you know, about new artists, new writers. That's amazing. It's just kind of the idea of the bridge Mm -hmm. and, and the scene, your show in particular. Yeah. Yeah, and well, what's cool about the scene is that um, I've been able to find, you know, I shouldn't say find, but like certain artists that are played on that program get um, brought to the attention of Bentley, the program yeah. director, and then she'll actually add them into regular rotation. So it's like with Localized, which was on All Buffalo, yes. which I loved doing that show, um, loved my time with the station. At the end of the day, Localized was an hour on Sunday nights, yeah. and that was it. Like that you know what i mean it's never going to co-mingle with the regular program right yeah. the music did not cross over that line and there were discussions about it and like i'm not you know pointing fingers or saying but at the end of the day the corporate radio structure really does not allow for that yeah um which is sad because I, and i think too it's important for people and maybe people generally do recognize this now i'm not really sure at the time when i was working at all buffalo it seemed like people their perception of radio was still very much what it used to be like prior to the 90s, which is they're thinking like, oh, every jock chooses their own playlist. And it's just not like that. I mean, it's all (laughs) pre-chosen. Like it's it's very different. So the bridge and stations like the bridge, I think are so important because they're actually following, they're the closest thing we have to that old school of what it was like. FM radio. Exactly, yes. Like where um, you're actually hearing artists that are in your region being played during the day, like regular hours. And um, And there's curation by knowledgeable DJs. Exactly, exactly. And unfortunately, I wish it was, you know, I. I think it was actually a Rush documentary that I saw where they were describing how they broke in and they yeah. were saying like, you know, they got on some station. Um, yeah, Donna Halper, who was a, a program manager at WMMS in Cleveland is the story. Yes. She played them. 
Yeah. It changed everything. Exactly. And then, uh, you know, back in the day, it would be like, well, oh, well, this song's doing really well here in this market. So I guess we'll pick it up over here. And, but that was back when stations were independently owned and they weren't all owned by like one (laughs) thing that was trying to reduce competition. So, in any event, um, well said. Yeah. I I think that uh, the bridge is, I, I just love everything about their mission and obviously I wouldn't be working with them if I didn't and uh, I'm really excited for what's to come and what this might mean for um, our community moving forward. Yeah, I am as well. Um, I do want to ask you though because you mentioned Bentley and you mentioned 107. At the time, even though perhaps never the Twain show meet with you know local and regional artists and you know the sort of primetime playlists Mm -hmm. that were were happening. I still felt that station had a real effect on the community here. Mm -hmm. Um, And all of a sudden we had a hip station, you know, that was very much like a Toronto station. Right. Uh, We started to see the effects of that. And then, you know, things like kerfuffle Mm -hmm. became a huge deal. Yeah. Um, It was amazing, and I think it did change Buffalo, and we're still feeling some of that change, but ultimately, you know, it it didn't last. Can you talk about why and how maybe that happened? Mm, Well, I guess I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there at the very end (laughs) as I already moved on. Um, I can only assume that it probably had to do with ratings and figuring that, oh, well, a country station will do better in this region than Despite the alternative station. Despite the fact station. that we already had one. I know, right. So it it doesn't totally make sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm sure if you talk to people who were there at the time, I know it was clearly very upsetting and it wasn't something that people expected. <laughs> no, it, it, from the outside, yeah. it was surprising. Yeah, it was a blind like, side. Wait, what's going on? This is huge. You know, there. There are festivals built off this station now. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and like I agree with you. People are coming to town who weren't before there was an alternative station. No, exactly. You know? Like those big shows are really cool. Yeah. And um, and I do think that it was ultimately all a very positive thing for the community. And to be clear, like when I was talking about localized before in the local music, I, yes. I didn't mean that in a way that was supposed to be derogatory or no. negative towards anybody else who worked at All Buffalo. Um, but it was all. just the nature of no, those the are beast. All good people, you know, but yeah. sometimes the structure is being imposed from exactly. outside the community and that can be tough. Right. Um, well, talk about the local show, um, the scene, you know, we're in the present day now. We're mm-hmm. not unearthing the past any longer. Um, how have you seen this evolving? How has the response been? What would you tell people out there, both as listeners and musicians who might want to get, you know, artists, songwriters, whatever, who might want to get involved? Sure. So um, it has been a slow grow, which is always to be anticipated. Uh, anytime you start something new, it's going to take a little while to get off the ground. Uh, that said, I do feel like over the last few months we've been getting more submissions yeah. and um, I'm starting to hear when I'm out at shows, um, I've had people approach me and say that they're listening, which is so cool. Very Love cool. that. Yeah. And uh, I, it's encouraging. Um, it's encouraged me. I think it's encouraging the rest of the station to hear that, <laughs> yeah. that there are people definitely tuning in. Uh, if you're an artist from Western New York or Southern Ontario. (laughs) I always have this little spiel. Um, We just asked for WAV files because, uh, and people ask why. That's because that's really the only file format that's compatible with our current log system. So in order for your song to play, it has to be a WAV file. Um, And then we can't have swearing, FCC regulations, you know, whatever. But um, other than that, we accept all genres. You know, we just want to hear your music. And as long as you're from the area, we're excited to share it. Uh, highly encourage you. Go to wbfo.org slash the bridge. Go to the submission form. It's right on the site. It's easy to do. It is. It's super easy. You did it. <laughs> I did. <laughs> you succeeded. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I just uh, like I keep saying, I, we have plans for 2024. You know, we're just getting started to this year. Uh, but um, I'm really excited for them and to see them take shape. And for the the show in general, I'm just so thrilled to be a part of it. And I feel really fortunate that I was um, asked to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're fortunate that you're, you're here doing it. Um, the, the, the sort of eclectic nature of what ends up being the playlist, you mm-hmm. know, um, it's really interesting. And it kind of tells a story of Buffalo that is, it's sort of an aerial view in a way. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, 
over the years, you know, when I was writing at the Buffalo News for a couple decades, I would periodically, somebody would be like, you got to write a story about the Buffalo sound. And I'd be like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, throw a dart. It's always changing. You know, mm -hmm. how do you put a pin in this moment? And how do you really describe what that is? Um, but, you know, I tried anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um is our uh, eclect eclecticism really what we are? Or do you have any kind of insight on that now that you've been doing this a little bit? I would be hesitant to, like you're saying, to nail any yeah. one sound. Because it's as reductive being, to do that. Right, right? the buffalo sound. Yeah. Um, and I said this to you actually in our previous conversation is that I am still learning so much yeah. about our music community. Yeah. <laughs> and frankly, there is so much I'm unfamiliar with and I'm now becoming... A little more familiar with through people's submissions but it's actually like i i do during my week i spend a lot of time just researching trying to find artists to reach out to um going on the spotify profiles or facebook or what yeah. have you hopping around from place to place just and through that yes i've been able to find people but at the end of the day what's really helpful is like word of mouth and then people reaching out to us because like there's only you know what I mean? Like sometimes yeah. you sort of reach the end of the line with the the link sure. tree of <laughs> trying to trace. And I feel that there are definitely, um, I don't know, there are just corners of our music scene that I have not yet like even yeah. come close to unearthing. So um, that's why I keep encouraging people. And it's also why I keep trying to do my own research to find um, more artists. That's right. I mean, yeah. I, there's a responsibility to do that. You know, I'm, I'm sure that you feel that you take it upon yourself. Um, and that's what I was trying to say. I mean, things move quickly here. They also move slowly. And mm -hmm. we are, I think, becoming more inclusive, but there's work to do there. Yeah. And and it's good, you know, it's, it's good that you're taking some of that upon yourself. And hopefully that, you know, makes it easier for word to kind of get around to, you know, every corner mm -hmm. of what makes us who we are, you know. Right. I think it's happening. And I mean, when it, when you listen to the show, you do hear a pretty broad mix of who we are, you know, as a scene. Yeah, which I love. And I intentionally kind of try to make it where it's not just all sort of one vibe yeah. for the entire program. Right, because we're hip hop, we're, we're funk, we're jazz, we're alternative and indie music you know, exactly we're metal we're we're all that yeah yeah i think you could say that of probably most scenes but it seems particularly rich here and very mm -hmm. um well pivoting a little bit to the other hat that you're wearing all the time <laughs> as an artist and now as a band leader i mean stress styles has evolved well it sounds like it started kind of as a band then became through circumstances, a solo mm -hmm. project, um, and now has kind of expanded again, right, to become a different kind of live ensemble. Yeah. Can, can you talk about that a little sure. bit? Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess, like, going back to the earliest, it started, so I used to call myself Wolf, and that was solo. Then that became a band. Then it was like, oh, there are so many bands with the name Wolf. Let's great. change it. So then we changed it to Stress Styles. Then, like we said earlier, Which then the band great, fell apart. Great band name. It's a great band name. <laughs> Thank you. It was actually funny because when I think I remember I thought of it, I honestly don't know why other than that, like, I tend to have a lot of anxiety and stress, and I think it just kind of came to me in that way. Um, but I wasn't even thinking about as soon as I brought it to the bandmates at the time, they were like, yeah, Goo Goo Dolls. And I was like, oh. <laughs> That's right. Another Buffalo band with dolls in the name. Was That's right. You know, but honestly, I didn't even think of it. Until I know. I was going to say, like, I never even thought of it. But then when they brought it up, I was like, oh, okay. Not that there's, I love the Goo Goo Dolls. So that's all okay. good. But like, it was pretty funny. Um, Anyway, so change the name of Stress Dolls. And like, we just explained how that all went. So uh, present day, um, what's been really cool is that I've gotten to collaborate with all these musicians yeah. that like for a long time I've admired. Um, so one of them being Josh English, yeah. who is the drummer. Incredible drummer. Great drummer. Yeah, he's in Grash. Many people know him from Grash as well as like numerous other yeah. projects in the scene, Stoneflower. Um, and so we actually got hooked into each other because uh, I got asked to play a cover show for Halloween at Mohawk Place and I wanted to do Nirvana. And Josh had expressed interest um, a few different times that he would love to do drums with me sometime. And so I was like, do you love Nirvana? And he was like, 
fuck yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, all right, yeah. Like, no, I mean, when you listen to him play, you know he loves your mom. Yeah, right, right. So I was like, okay, he's, sick. He's got that groove. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's the first show we played together, which was great. TJ Luckman on bass yeah. um, had been previously part of Wolf and Stress Styles, and so that was a no-brainer. Uh, Jordan Smith on lead guitar. Um, she and I actually met because we worked together at the Buffalo Public Library, and uh, she filmed Wolf doing a Tiny Desk contest entry, oh, how cool. which was really fun. So Mohawk Place, it was just um, when that happened. That was um, actually in the library. We okay. like our entry was. Um, are you asking? Was this for the Nirvana show there, or what? I'm sorry. No, I, well, I, I just. Forgive me if I just confused the No, it's okay. <laughs> I just recall that Mohawk Place was involved with trying to get artists to submit f for the uh, yes. NPR Tiny So, Dust yeah, they actually did contest. do, you're right, they did like an NPR Tiny Dust series themselves that yes. would be like a anybody who had participated in the online competition was then asked to play a big show. Right. And um, I'm not just hallucinating. No, you're this. not. You're not. And to know, Chelsea. <laughs> no, to know. <laughs> we did that once as Wolf, actually, funny story. And we ended up playing at the very end of the night, and it was a weeknight, and we stopped our set I think at like 2 in the morning 2.30 in the morning and it, there had been an ice storm outside and all of our cars were encased in ice this is so buffalo and so right so it's like 2.30 a.m. and we're jamming <laughs> at the cars to try and anyways um, but so Jordan and I met like I said from doing this tiny desk entry and then uh, we followed each other on social media just honestly kind of acquaintances but I saw her always posting um, video of her just playing original guitar uh, riffs just like 30 second and I loved the sound and so when I started recording uh, my last CP which is called Forward I asked Jordan if she would be interested in writing some parts for a couple of the songs and she was down and then from there she joined the band um, and then I should also mention that prior to this four piece version of Stress Dolls uh, you know coming back to Buffalo after the whole hospital Nashville thing and kind of getting back into the scene as a solo artist the first person I really collaborated with in any capacity and felt comfortable with was my friend Sally yeah. um, who's a violinist and also we had met from working at the library but honestly became better friends afterwards um, we reconnected at a a birthday party of a mutual friend of ours and then uh she told me that she liked the writing and would love to maybe play together sometime and so we kind of started doing some duo gigs and we still do that uh so that's been really she's she's an incredible talent oh my god she's fantastic so yeah. the band the sound kind of has become you know more expansive is mm -hmm. that fair to say oh yeah for sure people are really contributing a lot to it mm -hmm. so um plans plans <laughs> i always have many plans <laughs> yeah that's what we do yeah right exactly we plan and then we see what actually ends up happening right um but let's see well in the next couple of weeks there will be a new single which is exciting um beyond that definitely planning a lot of out of town shows or at least as many as i can you know like i mentioned i, I deal with these health issues so i try and be smart about it um i don't think as much as it was always my dream to be like the full-time touring artist, realistically, I'm not sure if that's ever truly going to be able to be my path just because like I I know what, I don't guess like know what life is like on the sure. road. I haven't like gone and toured for weeks at a time, but I've read enough about it. I've had my short-term experiences of going away for maybe like three shows at a time. And I just know that for long-term stretches, unless you know, unless I had like my own tour bus and sure. whatever. I mean, there's just, it's just a very, um, it's not a super comfortable lifestyle. No, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. And, and it's not just that it's hard. It's just not practical in many ways either. Right. Well, when you're dealing with things where it's like, I need to cook all my meals. Right. I need to like have specific times a day where I'm like getting in rest and eating or whatever. I mean, it's just not very conducive to that lifestyle. And mm -hmm. that's a lifestyle I must maintain in order to right. be functional and actually able to do any of this. Um, so uh, when I say out-of-town shows, like, you know, sticking to weekend stints, maybe like three, maybe four at a time. But um, as like as much as I can get out there in any way, whether that be with the band or solo, I'm trying to do that as much as I can. Um, so looking forward to that. And uh, other than that, yeah, just shows, more music, definitely recording, maybe some more demos on the way um, for the next record that will come after this upcoming record, which is still not out yet. 
Well, that's, that's right. You're looking that far ahead. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think of new things to do all the time. So it's always a journey. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate your time, uh, your investment in Buffalo, big time, because we need that, you know. Um, and also the way that you kind of turned your own love for music into a community-facing kind of idea, you know, is inspiring. You know? I think it can inspire the growth of our scene and actually quite literally help it by providing a forum for that. Um, so we appreciate you well thank you so much Jeff appreciate you too thanks for uh, having me on and thanks for continuing to let people know about the Buffalo music scene through your writing you know it's there's a lot here yeah and I think we're all on the same side of, like, <laughs> loving it and, and wanting to see it continue to grow mm -hmm, for sure so thank you and uh, let's get together again we have a lot of other things to talk about as well um, we should do some cool stuff yeah That'd be cool. great. <laughs> Thanks, Chelsea O'Donnell. Really appreciate you being here. And everybody tune in. Uh, listen to the scene on WBFO The Bridge on Sundays. If you're an artist, send your stuff. If you're uh, a music lover, support, talk about it, and share it. Yes, please. <laughs> we want to hear your music. We want to air it. Um, yeah, please submit your music. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>